Thank you for joining us for Abundant Life Church Online today. Well, before we get to the message, I just have a few announcements to share with you. We just want to say thank you so much to each one of you for faithfully supporting Abundant Life Church through an e-transfer at giving at AbundantLifeCap.com. Also, we want to stay connected with you. If this is your first time joining with us, we would invite you to, to go to our website at AbundantLifeCap.com, follow the link to our Connect card, and fill this, this online card out. Let us know um, how you found out about our church, um, if there's uh, how we can best connect with you. Also, let us know um, if you need information about our kids or student programs or whether you, you want information about our life groups or what other things that our church has to offer. Also, you can use this Connect card to submit a prayer need as well. Well, something that our church, Abundant Life Church, practices is water baptism. And we are going to be holding a water baptism class on Sunday, June the 12th, after the morning service at our location in Campus Casing at 13 Ash Street. If this is something that you are interested in, you, are, you would like to be water baptized, or you might just have some questions about what is water baptism, um, please join us for this water baptism class on Sunday, June the 12th. We believe in our community and, and we love to come together as a community. So on Sunday, June the 26th, we are gonna be having a church barbecue at Riverside Park between 12 and 2 p.m. Um, this is gonna be just a great chance to come together as a church community to have some fun together. But also, this is an opportunity for you to come and to, to honor and say thank you to Pastor Sarah Coombs for her many faithful years of ministry at Abundant Life Church. While we really pray and, and hope and believe that this message is gonna be encouraging and it's going to be helpful for you today. Well, hello to our online audience. I just wanted to start off with a couple of questions to kind of set up this, this series. Uh, the first one is, do you know that there's a book in the Bible called Revelation? Just something just to ask yourself, and what do you think that Revelation is talking about? Um, we've called this series for the month of June. We're calling it, What's Your End Game? And we will be exploring some of the portions of Revelation. At the end of the series, we want you to understand what your end game is or should be concerning life right now and looking towards your future eternity. John is kind of the central figure of the book of Revelation. And today we want to focus on the author or the man who wrote Revelation and kind of look at his synopsis of what is the message of Revelation. I've invited my good friend Joel into this conversation regarding the book of Revelation. Uh, he is my friend. He is a biblical scholar. He's a family man. He loves fishing. He loves hunting. He'll, he'll fish it and gut it and kill it. And, but you know what? He is passionate about Jesus and helping people know Jesus intimately and, and knowing the truth of the Bible. So, I love this quote that you, you uh, mentioned to me. G.K. Chesterton once remarked that though St. John the Evangelist saw many strange monsters in his vision, he saw no creature so wild as one of his own commentators. I love it. That guy has got, he's gold. But let's take a look at this man who wrote the book of Revelation, John. So Joel, who, who is John? Maybe give people a kind of a context of who is this guy, John? Right. Well, Dan, thanks for what you said there. Hope half of it's true about myself and appreciate you right back, brother. And uh, yeah, good for you to bite into this, this topic and this, this book, this letter. Um, and so, John, when it comes to looking at John, again, there's a lot of different options out there, and some would say uh, different things than what we're going to say. But traditionally, and that's kind of where I land, is that 
we're dealing here with, um, you know, one of Jesus's disciples. Mm-hmm. Most people probably have heard of the gospel of John, yes. right? Like the son of Zebedee, James and John, um, the beloved, right? The, uh, the cousin to Jesus. So um, the gospel of John, you know, first, second, third, John, uh, and then Revelation would make up traditionally what we think would be written by 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 John. So again, we can't be overly dogmatic about it, um, but that's kind of where I land. And traditionally, I think that's kind of been the interpretation that Revelation was written by John uh, the, right. the apostle. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. And, and a lot of people might not think that or even knowing that John was actually Jesus' cousin. That, that's learning new things. Um, let's kind of look at the historical timeline for Revelation. Kind of some of the things. What is the date uh, when Revelation was written? What's happening with the Christians? What is the political climate? And is this a great time to be a Christian? <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> sure yeah exactly right okay well again right um we know i think a verse you're going to read there for us dan uh it helps us understand a little bit of the context one like would you read verse nine for us dan because that might help us maybe place, yep. place a little bit okay sure sure yeah. so this is what revelation chapter one verse nine says i john your brother and partner in the affliction, kingdom and endurance that are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Right. So uh, thanks for reading that. And I think that helps us because identifying a landmark, right? The island of Patmos. Yes. So what we know about that is that Rome used that island. It's just off the coast there in the Aegean Sea. You can look it up, the big Mediterranean, and then there's a little bay north. It's in there, and Rome used that actually as a penal colony to send uh, their prisoners, to send people that were, you know, uh, enemies of the state. They would send them there essentially to die. Yeah. Uh, Patmos was kind of a, a rock quarry island, so it's barren. It's it's got yeah, not yeah. not a lot of good stuff on it. Um, there's a few a few seaports that Rome would use um, to launch you know vessels out into the Mediterranean or whatever. But but anyways, Patmos served really as a prison island, and so yeah. um, so if John is there then we're, we're kind of now starting to, to piece together under what time could he be there? Like yes. when could he find himself there? So, so this is kind of where I've landed on this. And again, um, others would disagree, but, but a little bit of a timeline may help us understand. So we do know that there were probably two um, emperors that were really uh, harsh on Christians. And harsh is the, is the nice word. Yes. Uh, we know that that Nero, oh yeah, Nero, okay, uh, wild madman, um, came to be emperor right in around AD sixty six. We know that because he launched a war on the Jews, right? Okay? Yes, lots of uh, hundreds of thousands of of Jews are being killed. Okay, so. So Rome is now targeting Christians. Nero is the the big uh, leader of the time. And we know that he's he's after the believers, like the troublemakers. We got to get rid of these guys. Yes. They're not towing the line. They're serving another Lord. Well, that's treason, right? Because Caesar is Lord in the empire. Okay. So Nero's going after them, right? So he destroys the temple. We know the temple fell in around 80, 70. Okay. That's when most of the writers started to write. That's when we see them writing. Okay, stuff, stuff's happening. They're being attacked. Um, what's going on? And so there's some communication happening. Okay, so so around, you know, uh, so from Nero 
uh, you know, being an emperor is not always the most secure job because we know that, you know, he was killed. And then uh, we have uh, Vespasian. And then eventually it comes to uh, Domitian. Okay. And I'll say Domitian because Domitian comes to the scene around 80, 90, 91, 92. Okay. All right. So why is that important? Well, because Domitian now has proclaimed himself to be the everlasting king. Right. And the Roman Empire, the everlasting uh, empire, the eternal empire. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And we know that Domitian was also targeting Christians. So Nero and Domitian, those are the two that, that come to my mind. So um, if John finds himself on Patmos, most likely it's, it's in and around the time of Domitian. Right. Yes. Nero probably would have killed him because okay. Nero killed, you know, a lot of them, but Domitian didn't. And, and, and here's an interesting little tidbit, right? Okay. Um, I think it was Tertullian and I, and I think it's, I found, I read this and I, I have reference of it somewhere, but there's a, there's a, a kind of a legend around John. Yes. Um, that, okay, so John, obviously, if, if he is the beloved, if he is the disciple, which I think yeah. he is, and he has a message to speak, and he has, he has um, a way to show the believers how to live, because he right. walked with Jesus, right? Yes. So he's now probably landed in Ephesus. That's where traditionally we think John is gone. Yep. Uh, Domitian's trying to build a temple, the first one in Ephesus. So maybe there's a problem, like maybe there's a guy in Ephesus that's, that's not towing the line and he's, he has a following. Okay. So what are we going to do? Like right. if you kill him, you're going to create a martyr system. So, so there's this, this legend around the capturing of John. So supposedly John gets captured okay. and supposedly they bring him into the Colosseum because that's what Rome does. They put him oh, on yeah. spectacle, right? Put him in the Colosseum. Let's let everybody see him die. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, supposedly they they had these pots of boiling tar and oil. And, and and we know that's true. But when it comes to this, there's a there's kind of a legend around the fact that they captured John. And in order to torture him, to get him to deny his faith, he actually was dipped in in boiling oil, wow. boiling tar. OK, wow. But he was brought out of it unscathed <laughs> and amazing. the reports was that people in the coliseum then began to confess that jesus is lord <laughs> amazing so like and now to think what are you going to do with this guy exactly so yeah. i say and so i i i think that john probably was exiled at that point yeah. under Domitian to patmos yeah um in and around you know the the early 90s yes okay so that's probably where i've landed that's what i think and it helps me understand yeah. then kind of the timeline where he's at what's going on um and we can come back to some more of those things but no was it an easy time to be a christian no um you you're in hiding Oh yeah, like you're you're running for your life. You have no home, uh, yeah. Jerusalem. You can't go there. The temple right. has been destroyed. The Rome That's is right. after you. Yeah, it, it, uh, it is not an, an easy time to be right. a follower of Jesus. Yeah, yeah. And even some of the key guys have been have been killed. Paul's Paul's been killed. Peter. Yep. yep. I think even Timothy at this time has. Yeah. Yeah. John's the last. Yeah. Like he's, he is the last. And yeah. so, yeah. And I think there's some wisdom in what Domitian did. Like, you know, let's, let's just send him to this penal colony. He's, he's in his yeah. 80s probably at this point. Yeah. And he'll die and this thing will die out. Right. Yeah. But, it's it's kind of like, uh, what was that movie? Lord of the Flies. Where they all were on this island. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and they all are kind of trying to fend for themselves. It kind of it kind of seems like that. It's just all right. 
here you go. Let's see who, like the ultimate survivor, right? Let's, who's gonna, who's gonna survive this? Um, I just want to read uh, Revelation one, not, uh, verse ten, and it says, "I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard a loud voice behind me, like a trumpet, saying, write on a scroll what you see, and send it to the seven churches: Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Tyth." Tyria, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. So eventually John does get off this island. Um, so what is the role that I think uh, he ends up in Ephesus? What is the role that John is playing for the church now? Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think you're right. I think he does get off the island. Um, you know, traditionally, people think that he did die in Ephesus that he got off like the mission dies and then we think John is allowed to come back okay um and so in and around late 90s 97 98 is you know 99 it's when John probably died and the missions I think uh he ends in 96 so anyhow John gets off and that's when I think he begins to write okay all right yeah, people, I grew up, you grew up probably being taught that, you know, he was experiencing and writing all of these things on the island. Right. Yeah, I'm not there anymore. Like this thing is just way too in depth and packed with Old Testament. Yeah. You know, it, it's been written very carefully. Right. It's been written strategically. Yes. And this is where I think we begin to, to see the, well, this is why I love it. It's my favorite book of the bible right like it's just yeah. so john now um begins to write again okay so he's written the gospel he's written yeah. for a second third time. he's writing again so why you know why is he writing again yeah. well he's in the spirit we know that and he's seeing things and yeah. Yeah. what he is has now seen he needs to write and so we need to keep in mind like you said a couple things here now he's writing specifically to specific congregations right okay so seven of them that's a good number um starts with Ephesus you read them so they're there because John is most likely deemed to be a pastor to them yeah a leader he yep, knows yep. the church he knows the people and he's he's writing to encourage them and so this has got some historical cultural um things that we need to we can unpack like it's written for specific people that's right for a specific time and he's he's doing so because like he's their pastor yeah and he's telling them well it's the good news right it, it's the subject matter which we'll get to it, it's all about jesus right but but he's he's writing as a letter he's writing because he's caring he's writing as a as a theologian he's writing as a, a poet yeah, um yeah. but let's keep in mind that it's 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 a letter but it's not just a letter this is prophecy okay um and i say prophecy because well it is the very in the very first few verses um, I'm not sure if we've read them yet, but we'll see it. Maybe this is a good time to read it. Sure. Well, but, I'm going to read the first, first three. The first three. It'll help yeah. us. Yeah. Okay. So this is Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. The revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave him to show his servants, which must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, whatever he saw. Blessed is the one who reads about, aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep what is written in it because the time is near. Oh, like, we just don't even want to just say amen if, you, if amen. you're if you're in that right now. Like, doesn't that just feed your spirit when you oh. hear that? Okay. So like we can just stop right now. Like, and Dan, how often do we just skip over this verse or these verses? Yep. So let's just unpack that a little bit. Absolutely. It's this is 
Number one, what does it say? The revelation of Jesus Christ. Yes. This whole thing yes. is telling us about Jesus. Yeah. This is <laughs> it's so profound, but we have to emphasize it because unfortunately, revelation has taken on of a different nature. Yes, it has. We have to remind ourselves, first and foremost, John, everything he saw, everything he's heard, everything yep. he's tasted, everything he's felt. Yes. With his experience in the spirit on the Lord's day, yes. on Patmos, is revealing it. Like, and this is someone who knew Jesus who walked with Jesus, who Absolutely. spent time with Jesus, but now Jesus is showing up in the spirit. Like, come on, folks. He's having an experience with the spirit that is revealing more of Jesus. Yes. Like, I don't know how, how more Pentecostal this can get, <laughs> right? Like, so this first and foremost is a word of prophecy because he says that this prophecy Yep. It's about Jesus. Okay. Now, this is where we need to kind of define prophecy because, Please do. again, okay, again, yes, um, bad habits, bad times sometimes creep in here, bad thoughts, bad theology. Biblically speaking, prophecy is not prediction. Okay. It's not. Prophecy is about speaking. Hmm. Prophecy is about testimony, right. declaration. Yeah. Right. Prophets were prophets because they spoke. Yeah. Prophets declared. Yes. Um, this is a word of prophecy because he, John, is, is speaking. He's declaring. He's testifying. Right, right. He says to the testimony about Jesus Christ. Yeah, that's right it's beautiful it's beautiful revelation of jesus in yes. the spirit here he's now seeing yep. jesus differently like that's good and now he's testifying he's he's prophesying he's being prophetic yes because this is all about jesus yes <laughs> like so he's serving now as a pastor like and you get this dan and you, you serve your people because every Sunday when you're communicating, you're being prophetic. Right. Like you're communicating what God's laid on your heart, what you've seen, tasted, experienced. You're now, you know, and, and we, we use our mouths, like we talk, we yes. speak, we Definitely. declare. Yes. <clears throat> like that's, to me, what prophecy is. Yeah. We are declaring, speaking, we're truth telling. Yes. You know, really about, about Jesus. And what I love about this understanding now, if, if we were to allow this, and this is why I love Revelation too, one of the many reasons. Okay. So let's just, John is now in the spirit hearing Jesus, seeing Jesus in a different way. Yeah. He's now getting a word for his people, for the church. Yeah. Um, it's a personal word, right? It, it, it cuts to right to the heart of the issue. Yeah. And prophecy helps us because it now lets us know that, that God is revealing something now. It's a revelation. Yes. Okay. Something's happening here. Yeah. And God is now speaking to us now. He's conveying something to us now, <laughs> yes. today, yes. right? Yes. And it, it, it all has to bring us back to, to Jesus. Like, that's the subject matter, plain and simple. Awesome. It, it has to. And that's really what prophecy is. Like, a prophecy doesn't bring us back to seeing and experiencing Jesus in different ways or richer ways, deeper yeah. ways. 
That's right. Then I, I'm really not sure what you're listening to. Like, yeah. like turn it off, right? Yeah. So, um, so yeah, John is being prophetic. He's being a pastor. Okay. And I'll just throw this one in too, because I'm I'm on a roll. Then I'll stop, and you can take it somewhere else. But you are we're going. So, um, what makes this also challenging is that he's also writing apocalyptically. Okay. I wish I had a P word, like he's pastoral, prophetic, but apocalyptic. Okay, we'll just get to the apocalyptically. Yes. Now this is where it's also challenging. All right, but you read it, and I'm just gonna I'm just gonna emphasize. What you read is right in our Bibles for anybody thinking that we're being heretical here. Like we're reading the Bible. Let's just, let's just put that on the floor. Put it up there. Right out there. Okay. The word of God. Yeah. Here we go. So it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. All right. We talked enough about that. that God gave him. So father to son to, you know, jo John via the angel. That's right. Yes. Okay. To what must take place. Now, my text says he sent it and signified it through his angel okay yes so it's that word right signified it i have a little footnote okay in my bible okay and the footnote in my bible says made it known through symbols oh <laughs> okay yeah so he sent it and signified it or sent it and symbolized it, or sent it via the use of symbolic yes. imagery, symbolic yes. language, through to his angel, to his slave, John. There's John. Yeah. Testified. Okay. So we have these concepts. Okay. This is apocalyptic. Now, apocalyptic literature is in the Bible. Okay, Daniel, Isaiah, Ezekiel, they are all apocalyptic literature. Why do I say that? Because uh, it's like the visual arts gallery of the Bible, right? Yeah. These wild visions of like creatures and yes. you know, wheels and, you know, yeah. things flying around. It's like, whoa, right? <laughs> so John is also having these same visions, and he's writing them. And so that genre or that kind of literature, we say, is apocalyptic. Right. Okay. So if everything is coming to John through symbols, that means we're going to see numbers that are symbolic. Mm -hmm. We're going to see colors. Yes. That are symbolic. We're going to see um, animals, right? Yep. That are symbolic. So we're going to see all of these things that are symbolic. Yes. That will have meaning to you know the original audience because they'll they'll get a lot of it, right? Yes, right. But it also means to us that. Uh, we have to also treat this as, you know, symbolic. Yeah. Okay. So I'm, I'm of the opinion, if this is true, okay, then, then every number is symbolic. Yes. Yeah. Can't take a hard line, literal approach. No, it's, you can't. It's symbolic. Okay. Right. Yep. Um, and the other thing I'll say, and then you can come back to whatever you'd like, Dan, is that apocalyptic sure. literature in nature really, so apocalypse means unveiling. Unveiling. Yes. Not so much, you know, end times. It's an unveiling. Yeah. It's like, you know, we don't have these anymore, but you used to go to the, to the theater and right. there was a curtain, right? Yes. And it's like, man, I want to see what's behind the curtain. Mm -hmm. like, I want to know, like, what's going yeah. on, right? Well, that's what apocalypse means. It's really an unveiling, a lifting of the lid, whatever you want to say, to really see what's going on. Yeah. It's a behind the scenes look. It's like, okay, now, okay, now I can start to make sense. Yeah. But what's going on and why? 
Yeah. That's why that's what apocalyptic literature right. helps us to discern. Yes. What's really going on in the world? Because I'm sure John and his audience, they had a lot of questions. Like, Lots. We were expecting Jesus to come back and like nuke Rome, you know, like yeah. what's going on, right? Yeah. So that's where this really helps because, yeah. okay, now we can really see what's going on. Yeah. No, I was, when I was, I was thinking of uh, the unveiling, the Wizard of Oz came to my mind, you know, when they have that, that moment. And they finally, they look behind the curtain and, oh, that's who the wizard is. Okay. So it's like they're, they're getting this unveiling. And I like how you talked about that we got to see it as symbolism. We can't go literal and symbolic. We have to see that John is being very symbolic. Um, some of the conversations that we've had before we even talked I love that you mentioned that the revelation shows that there's something going on in the invisible realm that affects the visible realm. So yeah. what's what's going on in the invisible realm that affects the visible realm? What what do you what do you mean by that? You know, I you you think that we would not have such a hard time with this, right? Like yeah. when you think of the day and age we're living in, like colds and viruses, things we can't see, yes, affecting what we right. do see right like but it's kind of like here in the west we've rationalized everything away and we just think well it's only within reason we got to reason everything and we're intelligent but okay so what apocalyptic literature does is that really it now shows us what's going on behind the powers of rome right now we, there's no way there's no way around this john is writing during the roman empire like he is yeah, this is what's going on. Okay, they're being yeah. targeted. Rome is trying to conquer the world. The Rome is trying to establish themselves as the everlasting empire. Like Domitian was building temples so that his subjects would worship him. Right. Like right in Ephesus, where John was living, that was his first temple. Domitian built one there. You know, he wants people to declare him to be lord right okay right. to be lord yeah so this this vision now of what john is seeing and 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 you know the the wondrous of it all is is helping us discern help it, it ought to help i'll say that it ought to help us discern the culture that we're living in the the powers that are operating in the world Yes. Okay. And it ought to help us then navigate this because, um, you know, it, it really should help us understand. It helps us see the present world we're living in via kind of the, the spirit world. Right. Yes. What's going on. Okay. So we have all these imagery all this vast descriptions of beasts and dragon and things like that right in 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 the in the in the letter okay a lot of some of it is some of it is labeled for us we know john tells us the the dragon we know who that is but the beasts you know oh, okay well we don't we don't know who that is although there's there's two of them and anyhow it helps us because i think we can now we should be able to discern when it comes to politics we should be able to discern when it comes to the systems of this world okay we see references to babylon we see references okay. to yes. commerce yes. you know econ you know the economy the kind of system that's in place here john gets into it all yeah okay and so then the believer, the follower, we can ask ourselves, this is where, you know, how, what system am I buying into? Right. Yes. Who am I worshiping? How, you know, what does my life look like that's right. here on earth? And so that's why I think it helps us. Well, I, sh I should say it ought to help us. Um, when we discern those things, it ought to help us with our lives in the here and now. Mm. Yeah. 
And I, I think a good example of like the unveiling and symbolism, um, Revelation 12 is a great, great chapter that kind of really looks at where, where it really shows that there is a lot of symbolism that, that John is using here because he, he uses numbers, he uses animals, he uses um, like even he references to stars being swept away. Like there's a lot of symbolism and imagery that, that John is using. And so for us to, to come and take it as a literal uh, position is just, is just not going to work. That's not how John, he's writing to, to people that understand uh, symbolism. And yeah. I think, especially in our day and age, this should be something that we understand. We live in a social media, we live in a media saturated world. This should be something that speaks to the church now more than ever. And uh, I really, I really hope that it, this series does that. Um, do you have any closing thoughts as as we've kind of began, we've kind of given them a taste of, of revelation, but I think it's been a good exploration. Any, any closing thoughts that you have? Yeah. And I think for us, you know, um, for those who watch, watch this video and, and people in your congregation, listen, I think I just want to say too, like, look, I'm a fourth generation Pentecostal kid, right? Like I grew up in the pew. My family loves it when I say I'm fourth generation Pentecostal, but <laughs> they don't, they say I say it too much, but I say that because um, I want, you know, the audience to know that, that, you know, I, I, I understand the, the challenge that we have in trying to see revelation in a, maybe in a different way. Yeah. Um, we haven't always gotten it Right. Right. But what for me, on my journey into this, this, you know, studying Revelation, it's been over a decade, you know, it was part of the master's journey for me. And I, I never really could understand how it was presented to me in Sunday school, you know, on a Sunday night, like I just like, this is amazing. And what I, what I, I am, have appreciated and what we're trying to do, Dan, is that look at, we're just trying to bring it right back to some of the basic you know, um, what John, what John wrote, like we read the first three verses, we, we talked yeah, yeah. about where he was. Yeah, um, yeah. And I think I hope and pray that, you know, we can sort of recapture, you know, take it back. Because the vision that he sees, and and the hope that it instills in us, and if we could see as John saw, and by the way, Revelation unfolds as he saw it it's not chrono it's not chronology it's as he sees things right yes. and we all i think we we all could use a fresh you know revelation of jesus yeah speak to me lord and that's the beauty about being yes. you know someone who believes in the spirit's ability to do that now right yes like this is what um keeps me going is that even you and I, your congregants, we can have uh, the same experiences in the spirit that John had. And boy, man, yeah, we need it. We do. We, we do. It. I like, I like, I think you said it at some point. Um, but I, I thank you, Joel, for, for joining me for this much needed conversation to bring some wisdom and encouragement and really we want to bring encouragement to people we don't want to beat them over the head with this i think too many people have used this to to create fear and and that's just not what john was trying to do we want people to have hope and enlightenment as they read this and i like even too that i think in in some ways when when john would send this it was to be read as a whole letter to read it uh, chapter all the way through and it's such a beautiful thing to think about that as, as a encouragement letter to the church. But you, you mentioned some great questions that um, Revelation gets us really thinking about. Um, who am I worshiping? Um, what value system do I live by? What will shape my lifestyle? Who do I give my allegiance to? And whose kingdom do I live for? Like We got we to gotta wrestle with those questions. And uh, so this week, 
um, I challenge you guys, go and read this letter of Revelation for yourself. There's 22 chapters. Read one chapter a day and just let it really just get into your heart and into your mind. And, and I want you to read it like John read it, where you read it with all of your senses. So as you read it, what do you see? What are you seeing in, with your eyes? What are you feeling in that moment as you're reading it? What are you tasting? Maybe you're just like, and this doesn't have to mean food. What are you tasting? Like we, the Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. What, what are you tasting? And then what are you hearing? What, what is God speaking to you? And, and I really pray for you that your eyes will be unveiled to the light of these unseen realities. Well, next week, we're going to continue this series. You have, we're not done with this yet. We got some more to talk about. Looking at what's your end game by looking at the mission revealed in Revelation. But before we go, Joel, could you just pray, for, pray with me today for the people that are watching? And maybe if you want to lead out as well, let's just pray uh, for the people that are watching right now. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I just thank you that you know every person that's watching, every person who's listening to this. I thank you that you have a word for us. You have an experience for us. You have something good for us. That's what you do. All good things come from you. Jesus, you are the fulfillment of all good things. You are the yes and you are the amen. Thank you, Jesus, that you're the alpha and the omega. You are our very beginning. You are our ending. And I pray tonight that as, as we journey through these next few sessions together, that by your spirit, you would come and reveal things to us so that we can see Jesus better, so that we can hear his voice. There is only one living word in Jesus. That's who you are. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would come as you Reveal to John that you do. You stand with your people. You are there. You know all about us. And I pray by your spirit, you would speak to us. We need to hear your voice. I pray for Pastor Dan as he shares with his church live on Sunday mornings. Would you speak through him, spirit? Empower his words. May they not fall to the ground, but Holy Spirit, would you empower them so that we would also hear the words of Jesus through our pastor. And we give you praise for this. And we thank you in Jesus' name. And Lord, I just pray that our eyes would be unveiled. Lord, I pray that this would be uh, maybe an aha moment for a lot of people as they read through the book of Revelation and begin to see what, what John wrote about, what he saw, what he heard, what he felt. Lord, I pray that it would be uh, an encouraging word for our people, Lord God, that as people are watching this, they would be encouraged that we get to see Jesus. The invisible is becoming visible, Lord God. We, I pray that our eyes would just be unveiled to what you want to speak to us throughout these next couple of weeks. And I ask this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, thank you so much, everyone for joining us for Abundant Life Church Online.